you very much. I would like to start by thanking EFI for this opportunity. And um, there are two ways I'm different. Um, one, I'm the only speaker from the fair sex, if you would like to call that. And uh, I'm the only mechanical thermal engineer. I don't, um, I don't really understand what electronics uh, engineering when you talk about what goes into a chipset and everything. But I know you guys are making my life, uh, the two ways to look at it, you're making my life very difficult and you're ensuring my job because you're putting in a lot of heat, you're putting in a lot of features into your chipsets and that's where I come in and I try to make it cool. Okay, so what is happening now is that um, I have a brief agenda, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. But in a nutshell, everything is getting compact. You guys are working on your laptops after about half an hour, two hours. You, you keep it on your thighs and it gets warm. And um, uh, your mobile phones, you start talking in it and then your ears are warm. So this is where, uh, you know, you need to start thinking about thermal design. And uh, I believe uh, in the telecom and networking field, thermal design is quite uh, important and they used to have full-fledged thermal engineers. And um, nowadays in some, in smaller products, not much of thought is given into thermal design. And it's more like people take it as a band-aid approach. You, like how Ajay uh, said, then you do your entire product and then Lo and behold, you see that there are some temperatures that are overshooting, you have reliability issues, and that's when you say, okay, I think this component needs a heatsink. Let's see which one I'm going to select. So you go through some catalogs and say, okay, this fits my design, and I'm going to use this. And sometimes it works. If you're lucky, it works. If you're not lucky, it doesn't work. So this is where I tell that um, upfront, taking into uh, consideration everything that goes into your product. What are the different compliances? What are the temperatures that you need to be looking at? These are important things that you need to consider when you are doing your entire product, especially if you think that the power density is high and you may run into thermal problems. I have a lot of slides on this, but I'm going to stick to the time. So if there's anything else, or if you'd like a copy of this presentation, just talk to me after the presentation. I'll be glad to share a PDF with you. Okay, uh, this one I'm just going to skip. Okay, what is a heat sink? Heat sinks are devices that enhance heat dissipation from a component to a cooler ambient, usually air, but sometimes other fluids as well. The primary purpose of a heat sink is to maintain the temperatures of the device being cooled within acceptable limits as specified by the component manufacturer. The component manufacturer is going to tell you your component will work as long as you keep the junction temperature below 125 degrees C. You're not going to be able to measure the junction temperature. So how are you going to uh, ensure? So you measure the case and it is 80 and you think, okay, that's fine. <clears throat> and why do we need to keep the component temperatures down? It's because it ensures proper operation of the device and improves reliability and the life of the component and the product in general. Okay, what are the factors to be considered while designing or selecting a heat sink? First and foremost, power that needs to be dissipated. Uh, the maximum allowable component temperature, if you have a manufacturer who is very generous and he says, my component will work up to 250 degrees C, great, but not always. Intel has a processor wherein the case temperature has to be under 75 degrees C and you have, and this has to operate in a worst case in my ambient about 55 degrees C. So you have only 20 degrees C to work with. And what is the available space and volume? I mean, if you have a huge one processor sitting in this big, you can take a big heat sink and slap on top of it. It'll work. What is the power density? This is where uh, volume and power dissipated. This, this is where things unite and say, what is the power density? How much of wattage per meter square are you trying to pump out? And then is it natural convection? Is it completely sealed? Do you have a phone uh, fan blowing air into your system? Is it a powerful fan or is it one of those small cheap fans that you see in your laptops? And um, pressure drop and then bypass effect. These are some more detailed um, terminology, but then this is when things get really, really fancy. And finally, you can design any heat sink you want in your computer, but can it be manufactured? Ultimately, that's the thing. You want, I mean, I can do anything with um, uh, the MCAT tools, 
But is it feasible to see a product like that when it comes out and can you make it? Finally, not la last but not the least, costs. Everybody is talking about cutting costs. So you want the cheapest and the best solution for your problems. <clears throat> Aluminium is the main, is the preferred alloy for heat sinks because it's, it has a good thermal conductivity and it's cheaper. Copper has about twice the thermal conductivity, but it is way costlier and way heavier. So, well, anybody wants to know the principles of heat transfer? It is a science which seeks to predict the energy transfer, which may take place between material bodies as a result of temperature difference. Basically, there's a uh, temperature difference is one thing at a higher temperature. There's the air at a cooler temperature. You want to extract all the heat and make it go to the air so that your component is cool and happy. What are the three modes? These are things that you probably learned in your first year of engineering classes where you have this general mechanical engineering class where it's conduction, convection and uh, radiation. In electronics cooling, all three of this, these modes of heat transfer occur. But then there will be one dominant way, uh, method. Like if you have natural convection or if you have forced convection and then conduction, sometimes mm -hmm. radiation is, an, is a factor to be considered as well. I'm going to skip through all these um, formulae and stuff in okay. the interest of time and the interest of not boring you also. Okay, so uh, these are some formulas that I... Uh, so basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking for a thermal resistance of the heat sink. You're going to say I need to remove this much of heat, I need this much of um, the performance of my heat sink has to have this much thermal resistance and then you're going to be flipping through the catalog. But this is the first line of approach and I don't, um, and that's the first thing that you should do. <coughs> so basically what you'll have, you will do is you have uh, the junction temperature from your component manufacturer and um, some other thermal parameters like the, the thick to JC which is the resistance between the junction and the case and you know how much power is being pumped out of your component. And given that, you're going to say, okay, I need a heat sink which will be able to function with this uh, performance. But what are the different parameters you can change in a heat sink to make it so that you get the uh, desired performance? You have the width, you have the base thickness, you have the length, you have the height, the fin thickness, fin spacing. So you can play with all these parameters. Uh, a lot of times if you're stuck in a corner, you don't have too much volume, and you are not finding a heat sink in, your catalog, in the catalog that offers a resistance, then this is where you can um, go back to your design boards and say, okay, let me, let me, how best can I optimize it, given these parameters in my system. <clears throat> Again, when you go into air-cooled um, systems, you have to consider the fan, the fan curve, the fan reliability, and these are uh, may, uh, factors to be considered when you're um, when you're thinking about thermal design and making sure that you're ultimately the product, ha product has to perform and be compliant. Okay, so these are some interesting things. See, just, just because you have a heat sink that is as tall, that really does not mean that you'll get more out of it. Bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Basically, what happens after some point, it's, it reaches its maximum um, performance capability. So, the smaller heat sink over there, and if you see the taller heat sink over there, you have more material and you would think, oh, that is bigger and that is better. Not necessarily. The trade-off between the costs and um, the cost is really not much because you're not gaining any much. May, maybe a degree or two by going up in that direction. So you have to see how best you can design your heat sink within the, uh, how best you can optimize and extract the most heat from your component into the ambient. And another thing is that if you have a heat sink and then the heat sink is small, much smaller than your enclosure, what happens is air will try to take the path of, path of least resistance. You want more air to go in through your fins of the heat sink. 
But then if you have a large gap between the top of the heat sink and the enclosure and there's nothing there, it's, uh, it will follow the path of least resistance. So most of the air will go bypass your heat sink and suddenly you will see that the heat sink that you selected has this performance, say 1 degree C per watt and you put it in your system, it is not really performing at 1 degree C per watt. Why? Because for all these reasons. So the 1 degree C per watt that your heat sink manufacturer tells you is under ideal optimal conditions. You have to see if you can extract the optimum performance of the heat sink based in your design. Okay, so then there is these fancy heat sinks called conical heat sinks and elliptical heat sinks. Uh, it's really not as uh, good as they say it is. It's just that they give you a feeling that it's really good but um, if you re if you take a moment and think about it it's the same thing again you have a higher more uh, gap on the top than on the bottom air is going to go over closer to the top of the heat sink than the bottom bottom is where the heat you need to remove the heat from and therefore you're not really um, exercising the heat sinks potential to the fullest So these are some uh, simulations, right? I mean, nowadays there's a lot of um, software available to simulate heat sinks, to simulate the flow. You can put in a lot of parameters and you can optimize your heat sinks. And this is uh, embedded in the SolidWorks, like the MCAT, MCAT um, software that you have. And it's a quick uh, run just to see if um, things will be, uh, you know, if you can, if you need to anticipate problems, if you think that's going to be a major problem. These are quick tools to um, visualize the flow and the heat flap and stuff like that. <coughs> Again, cooling, um, okay, this is quite important, like when you have a heat sink uh, and you want to orient it, if it's natural convection, you need to orient it in a different way and you have to think about it, okay, it's gonna, is it going to be, am I going to have extra forced air blowing through my system or is it going to be natural convection? I didn't mean to go to my end. Okay. <coughs> okay, so this is the uh, first convection. Again, there are things that you have to make sure that the fins are oriented in the airflow. You don't want to have the um, heat sink blocking the airflow. You don't want to have the fins lateral transverse to the airflow. I mean, these are some basic uh, stuff, but then you'd be amazed sometimes how you don't take into consideration these uh, small design things, but which can make a big difference um, later on. Okay. I mean, I don't want to get too technical, so these are um, for people more uh, mechanical engineering based uh, audience who are designing heat sinks or are involved in thermal design. Uh, but uh, again, like I said, uh, if there is somebody in your team who would like to have a copy of this presentation, um, feel free to give me and send me an email. I'd be glad to say it, uh, share it with you. Uh, one more thing that you need to understand is like when you put a heat sink on a component, uh, the contact is not going to be complete it's not going to be perfect contact. There's going to be voids. So you obviously you use something in between a car, the heat sink and the component. It's going to be some kind of a material called the thermal interface material. Some thought has to be given into what kind of thermal interface material you're going to use between the um, component and the heat sink. There are different um, types over there. Uh, by selecting the wrong type, you may end up with some problems. So it's good to think about all this when you are at the product development cycle rather than when you are ready to release and then suddenly you have problems <coughs> with um, such issues. <coughs> okay, at some point one reaches the limit of air cooling and then you may go to fancy heat sinks like bonded fins, sky fin, heat pipes and then you will go to uh, right now with all these inverters and you have IGBTs and they are really, really high um, power dissipating components. So in those cases, you would go into a liquid cooled heat sink. 
uh, basically liquid cooled heating is somewhat similar like a heat exchanger where you have instead of air you have liquid flowing in and flowing out of the system and the heat is carried away by this uh, liquid. <coughs> Again, liquid cooling also, these are like um, very, very um, advanced uh, um, heat sinks there. You have to consider what kind of channel design and what um, uh, works best for you. But again, these are um, areas where if you are in a liquid cool, if you are in a position where you need liquid cooled heat sinks, then I'm sure um, the electronics engineer uh, audience here will not be uh, interested with the responsibility of coming up with a liquid cooled heat sink. I'm sure there will be. Uh, specialized people would be working on this. <coughs> okay, there are some disadvantages. You wouldn't want to go into a liquid cooled system right at the drop of a hat because there are a lot of disadvantages in that. You want to meet the limit of air cooling first before you move into a liquid cooled heat sink. And uh, there are a lot of disadvantages as advantages, but then again, um, it's uh, if the situation demands that you move into a fancy heat sink, you should do so. Otherwise, should take what works for you. <coughs> okay. Um, for, uh, I don't know if this, uh, there's a new welding technique out there called friction stir welding. I thought it's, uh, it's a pretty neat um, technique. And just so, just to have some variety in the presentation, let me show you a video. what this is. Um, basically, uh, this is a technique that, was, that is used to uh, fuse two aluminum components together. Um, when you have two um, aluminum components like this, two pieces of the hearts, so to speak, there's a spindle that rotates in very high RPM, like 6,000 to 7,000 RPM. And then when, you, when it comes in contact with the metal, aluminum, it plasticizes the metal. And it, the metal will now flow into the gap. And after the operation is done, it is fused. Now this is a different welding technique compared to other MIG welding and TIG welding because MIG welding and TIG welding you add you add some kind of impurities and you add something to stick it. Here you're you're not, you're not adding any additives. It's just the aluminium itself. You're just plasticizing it and using it this using the same aluminium to bond the two metals together. Now this is helpful when you have a liquid cooler because you have to um, you'll have a lid. And generally, electronics and fluids don't go well together, and that's where electronics engineers will scream at the thought of a liquid cooled heat sink because it's, you know, what, a, what about leakage? It's going to you know, blow the whole system up. So that's when, if you are forced to do a liquid cooled heat sink in an electronics um, cooling environment, friction stir welding is the recommended uh, method for a liquid cooler. Okay. Final thoughts? Uh, the global market for electronic thermal management is forecasted to reach about $8.6 billion by 2015. Uh, miniaturization of products along with increase in features is leading to higher power dissipations and more importantly power density. Uh, upfront pelt out our thermal design will eliminate thermal problems at later stages. At this time there might be no recourse or if there is one it might be an expensive one. So it's good to kind of have an idea of um, how will your system perform uh, thermally? Uh, working closely with your thermal solutions provider will ensure you you have a solid thermal solution for your electronic product. And this is what SAPA has to offer to all of you electronics engineers out there. I am Dr. Ram Paul. Actually, I wanted to know your thoughts on... Uh, see, people talk about phase change materials, nanomaterials... Yes. To the heat transfer coefficient increases uh, because of these factors. Is there something uh, we can use it in power electronics or it is only at a very nascent stage? No, phase change has, uh, nanomaterials are not really done any, uh, given much thought into it. But phase change, uh, uh, you can, yeah, definitely it is used out in, in the industry. But the problem is like um, rework is a big uh, issue. I mean, manufacturing. So what happens is if you have a component 
and you have used the phase change material and you have attached a heat sink on top of it and then you cure it and everything, a lot of times these phase change materials are so good that the heat sink will not come off the component. You want it to be good but you don't want it to be that good. <laughs> when you want to rework, it, I mean, it's, I had a situation where I tried to rework it and the entire AC came out of the PCB but the heat sink was still glued on to the component. So. <laughs> Ma'am, I'm Srinivas. Ma'am, uh, actually we got a product from Reliance Industries Limited. We have designed a product for Reliance. So it is having a very big display, seven segment display. So the product is almost finalized in the final testing with the cabinet. So there is an acrylic sheet uh, on the front side, acrylic sheet okay. for display. So after uh, operating it for four, five to six hours, the acrylic sheet, uh, some, da some kind of scattering uh, I'm seeing. Okay. Light, light scattering. <coughs> So, so again now the product is on hold right mm -hmm. now. So can you suggest me because uh, the heat is produced from uh, what you call uh, from the display side. Oh, okay. And we have we cannot uh, give any ventilation on the front side. So can you suggest me what to do? Uh, <laughs> how much uh, the, you know? Uh, if there's not too much of um, space over there, and you know, I mean, has the comp. Has it been identified which components have been uh, are causing the problem? Uh, in which seven segment display, seven the display ah. it dissipating heat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and if we have maintained some distance, if the distance is more, uh, if the look is not good. The feel and look is not good. Correct. Oh. So now for the past one week ten days the product was on hold. Ah. And the client. Yeah, is there's I don't know which what you can use under the display. I mean, okay, there, uh, there are some. If there's very small volume, there is uh, something like Comerix. Uh, Comerix is one company which uh, offers very thin um, heat spreaders. So that's probably something you can use to just not localize the heat and spread it out before it reaches the display. So that's. Thank you, and uh, feel free to contact me at my email address or. Uh, my phone number, some of the websites that I visit for information on thermal design is uh, coolingzone and electronicscooling.com. And thank you very much for your attention.